This is the Sitecast by MD Edge. I'm the voice of MD Edge Podcast, Nick Andrews. And welcome to the 150th edition of the Sitecast by MD Edge. I am Nick Andrews. And as we drop this episode, it is the Thanksgiving holiday here in the United States where Medscape and MD Edge are located. And of course, we are thankful for all of you taking this journey with us 150 episodes ago. Kind of hard to believe sometimes when you put it like that. Before the Thanksgiving holiday, everyone has off, so we have a best of edition for you. We wanted to do the best of COVID. Now, of course, when the lockdown happened, everybody kind of guessed that COVID would indeed have some sort of impact on mental health as there was something very scary happening to every human being on the planet. There was also required often isolation, social distancing, stay-at-home orders. There was quite a bit of alcohol consumption, record-breaking alcohol purchases. So there's a lot of things going on in the mental health community. So in the following order, we're going to replay the best from our interviews in one masterclass lecture on COVID topics, including Dr. Lisa Coyne, who will be, uh, of course, our first clip, clip up, Dr. Christine Moutier, Dr. Sanjay Gupta from his masterclass edition, and Dr. Peter Yellowlees. Now, all of these were uh, published in the second half of 2020. So if you've been listening along, it's something to uh, you can go back and recall or, or you know whatever you want to do as far as listening to it. But we thought that putting them all together might be a nice little zeitgeist for the year with regard to COVID. Uh, We hope to see you again uh, following the Thanksgiving holiday. If you're traveling, please stay safe. If you are traveling, please remember to quarantine, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, enjoy this best of episode. Thanks again for 150 episodes of the Sitecast. This is Dr. Lorenzo Norris, Editor-in-Chief of MD Edge Psychiatry. Today, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Coyne to the Sitecast. And she's going to be talking with us about, again, very, very, very relevant topics around the themes of anxiety, um, childhood anxiety, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And we might even dab a little bit into uh, the uses of ACT therapy in terms of strategies that we can use to um, help uh, either children or adolescents or family members for that matter, um, when we're dealing with anxiety and stress, particularly around these very stressful times. So uh, please just stay with us. And this is going to be a really informative Sitecast. So Dr. Coyne, welcome to the Sitecast. Now, I have to be honest with you. When I saw you on the schedule, I was very, 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 very excited because I have two young daughters here, 14 mm-hmm. and 11. Wow. And I li- yeah, yeah, Wow. And I live in a community where we are just having, and we this we said this on a previous sitecast, mm. large amounts of anxiety, uh, not only in our kids, uh, but even in parents trying to cope and trying to figure out how best to support our kids with um, as they're trying to fit, navigate school. Whether it is whether you are all virtual, whether you are hybrid, it brings about a change in routine and a great deal of stress. So, uh, Dr. Coyne. I mean, I'm just I'm just waiting to hear from you in terms of just your your thoughts in general about what you're seeing out there in regards to child and adolescent anxiety, in particular in the midst of the pandemic. And also specifically, now that we've gotten probably the first quarter of school under our belt, and then maybe starting to get into just some general themes in terms of what parents or clinicians can do in terms of supporting their children. So please go ahead. Such a great question. And full disclosure, I too have a teenager at home <laughs> who's going right. through this. He All is right. 15. So there you go. 15. So, oh, we are like best friends now. <laughs> exactly. So I know this topic, I suppose, from on a personal level, but also as a professional working with lots and lots of kids, teens, and parents in the community. And I will say that for the vast majority of them, you're right, they are experiencing increased anxiety and stress. Um, And a lot of it is coming from the uncertainty of what's going to happen. And you might think that it's also, well. and I will say also that there's some variability in this. For some kids, it's, you know, comforting 
to be home if they are not in school and they are Zooming. And so some of the young people that I speak to are delighted. They are thriving because they feel like they don't have the social pressures necessarily of being in a school setting, doing their work. On the other hand, other people are just hating it. And it makes them anxious having to be, you know, on a Zoom screen where other kids have their cameras on or off, et cetera. Um, so there's all of that going on. And then it's, it's also tough, right, for parents, because depending on the age of your kids, like, so for us, our kids are a little bit older, right? But for parents of young children, it's so difficult, especially if they're either working from home or if they're caring for, you know, they're in the sandwich generation and they're sort of caring for elderly relatives, trying to keep them safe and also manage young children's attention staying on Zoom. So there's a lot of anxiety all around. Um, but yeah, a lot of it's about feeling left in or left out of social groups. Am I be going to be a part of things at school if I'm home? Um, and then if they are in school, there's a lot of concern. The kids are actually quite good at, um, you know, talking about their stress around COVID. And I've heard several say, you know, what's the point of sitting in a classroom if I know I'm going to increase my risk? And they are aware, most of them, of the cases ticking up. Um, and so that's hard. But I think overall, all of us are kind of captured by the sense of uncertainty. And first of all, how is it going to be handled since we don't have a clear, coherent, central response, but we have differential responses across states and cities and towns, depending on the rates, right? There are different cultures around how much we believe in the science. And that is really challenging when you have children who you're teaching science to, right? And then there's the, you know, we're all watching the cases tipping up and up and we're all kind of understanding we're going into this third wave and that no matter what we're doing at this moment it might change in a moment and you know school might get called off yeah. so there's a lot the points around uncertainty and what in that what that uncertainty causes um, if you will, in trying to manage one your day-to-day -day life in dealing with COVID and helping your kids as well I'm, I'm using this from the aspect of being, um, if you will, a parent, but we could also obviously for our child and adolescent psychologists, um, our psychiatrists, our social workers, or any uh, mental health professional that treats uh, predominantly children and adolescents or families with children and adolescents, you know, how you help each other deal with this uncertainty. Yeah. Now, as you mentioned, kids are different. Kids are different. In mm -hmm. some children, and I want to call upon your expertise, uh, yeah. in terms of OCD, some children either obviously have OCD or have, if you will, more of an anxious or OCD temperament. Do you have any thoughts about one, how this is affecting them and just how you all are working with this in your center in the midst of the COVID environment? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so one of the things that we know is that if you struggle, well, first of all, I think one in three of us at any point, mm -hmm. if we took, if we think about lifetime prevalence rates oh, yeah. is gonna have clinically meaningful experiences of anxiety. And yes. we all have anxiety at different levels. Otherwise we wouldn't have evolved to be able to get ourselves out of threat and danger. Mm -hmm. So for some of us who struggle with OCD or an anxiety disorder, what that suggests is that you are experiencing some extreme distress or some functional impairment where you're not this, you know, how you're coping with your anxiety or your OCD is getting in the way of your daily living, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you are in that crowd and in that camp, right, as many of us are, these are stress sensitive illnesses. So if your baseline stress is higher due to concern about, you know, COVID, to, to uncertainty around, for example, or if you're in the US, the election, due to you know, economic uncertainty, as many of us are experiencing in the US, given the extreme income disparities, right? Your chances that you're gonna see an exacerbation in your anxiety or your OCD are higher. And that is in fact what we are seeing in our kids. And many of us who are clinicians are noticing that we're getting calls from, from clients from the past. We're having a huge demand in, in services. And so 
what one of the things that we are trying to do is podcast just like this to get some information out there and doing lots and lots of these um, on different venues doing support groups we just organized a young teen and adult a young adult and teen support group in our practice just simply to give kids a space you know if they're on the anxious side to put things down no, they're not alone, right? And to connect, even if it's Zoom, but to connect with some fellow travelers. And then the other thing that we're doing with our OCD population is, you know, helping people focus on the CDC guidelines or the state relevant guidelines, you know, because the question keeps arising, am I doing too much? Am I getting pulled in if I have contamination fears, you know? Mm -hmm. And am I backsliding if I'm, you know, washing my groceries or something like that? And so we really talk about sticking to what is the current literature. And again, that's hard because, of course, we know that it's not always clear what the CDC says, yeah. mm -hmm. right? right? So, there, I mean, it's really this uncertainty. Is, it's so at the heart of everything. It's so challenging for all of us. But I think as clinicians, one of the things we can do is to normalize that for yeah. our clients because this is not just them experiencing increased stress. Clinicians are also. And so the other thing that's happening mm -hmm. is clinicians are supporting each other. Yes. At, to support their clients. Yeah. And that's a really important piece. I don't know about you, but probably one of the biggest things or questions that I get from either fellow psychiatrists, primary care clinicians, uh, media, neighbors, um, you name it, um, my pickup basketball team, all of it is whether or not COVID, the pandemic is actually going to increase the rates of suicide. People are knowledgeable these days and they have seen the evidence in regards to suicide rates increasing. I mean, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has done a very good job of really advocating and putting suicide on everybody's mind. But Dr. Moutier, could you please tell us a little bit in regards to how we should be thinking about, if you will, the risk factors or suicide risk factors in COVID. Absolutely. Thank you for raising this because it's, it's actually really important that we not assume that it's, um, that it's all bad and there's nothing we can do. Because when it comes to suicide, even though it's complex, it is at the end of the day, a health outcome that just like every leading cause of death, we can do more from a research funding, a public health perspective. And that also relates to our role as clinicians. And by the way, also as family members and community members. So while COVID, obviously we, we've all seen the data around how much um, increased prevalence in the public, uh, rates of depression, anxiety, loneliness, isolation, uh, grief, uncertainty, all of those things are, are clearly threats to mental health and, um, and where when mental health is deteriorating for a population. Now there's, I mean, of course it's everybody, but for those who also carry some significant risk for suicide, that's, that can converge in a, in a very dangerous way in terms of suicide risk factors. Mental health conditions are, are a known risk factor for suicide, but they are not a standalone um, risk factor for suicide. It's always an interplay between multiple mm -hmm. converging factors. And so... Um, but there, but there is other bad news. There, we we know about COVID's impact on employment rates, on financial crisis, on um, well, the disproportionate uh, health and morbidity and mortality rates for communities of color and mm -hmm. other populations where those health disparities were always there. But mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. that that those margins are exaggerated and pressed upon. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so that in my mind intersects with a time when not only has our nation's suicide rate been on the rise, it's been a steady increase mm -hmm. year by year since 1999 for an overall increase of 35% um, to the last year that we have suicide data, uh, the CDC is 2018. Um, but among especially, um, well, middle-aged populations, mm -hmm. but also youth of color, mm -hmm. Yes. Black youth are showing increases that are disproportionate even to other 
demographic uh, youth groups um, related to suicide attempt behavior as well as suicide deaths. That mm-hmm. suicide attempts are also on the rise for Latina youth. So mm-hmm. there, there are certain populations that we were watching, you know, the, the overall trends and then also these different demographics. And so COVID um, is, is, a, is a vast mixture. We see how the rates of, of alcohol use and mm-hmm. alcohol purchase has gone up. Mm-hmm. Also firearm sales yes. have increased by 85% year over mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. Um, during COVID, for, uh, it was a March uh, yes. measurement compared to March of 2019. Um, so all of this means we must do more to make sure that um, that that the prevention of suicide and identifying those who are at risk is on our minds. Because what the science tells us largely is that if we scale up evidence-based efforts. We, we know we can reduce suicide rates. That has, ha- that has been demonstrated um, in research studies and also in other countries where they have actually put much more um, full implementation and resources behind their national suicide prevention plans. So, you know, so the, the, the message then is that while there are lots of these um, sort of increases in known suicide risks going on, that if we do more, and, and that, that is an important if, but also with some of the silver linings that we may talk about later, it's not a foregone conclusion that suicide rates will rise. Um, we, we actually have data from other countries that's more real-time suicide surveillance mm-hmm. data that looks somewhat reassuring right now, um, believe it or not. And so that that is some good news. It doesn't mean it, it, it's, you know, this pandemic is long lasting, right? Yes. So. Um, and, and there are different psychological responses to these different phases mm-hmm. of, of a disaster like this that we're all in together. So it, it's even if we've been doing pretty well as a, an overall population, we can't let down our guard. There's this intersection, but the take home point when I was hearing you was that it doesn't need to be a foregone conclusion. So we absolutely have the tools. And as you were just talking, you're like, you know, we can do better. It almost makes me think of like uh, an RFK quote, like, uh, we can do better, so we must do better. So, exactly. um, you know, so that that is something that I think of. So with that spirit of we can do more, we can do better. What is it? What role does everybody have to play in preventing suicide? Absolutely, because it is true that we all have a role to play, whether you're wearing your clinical hat or not, whether you're noticing signs of distress in a colleague, mm-hmm. a family member or a community member. Um, you don't have to be everybody's doctor. And, and um, you know, sometimes I think it's almost like works against us because we, we, we think about things that we don't need to be thinking about. We can be just a loving, caring community mm-hmm. member, family member who reaches out, let's say, you know, to a colleague where you just notice this, their usual patterns of behavior, something is just off. And it's, and it's kind of triggering, triggering your radar to say they don't seem like themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I have learned to actually pay attention to that, um, you know, not just wearing my clinical hat, but w- mm-hmm. in my in my normal day to day life with the people around me, we're, we're so much more attuned to behavior patterns. And when those kind of go off the rails, even a little bit. And, and here's the thing with with this approach, we're talking about deepening our conversations mm-hmm. with with anyone and everyone in our lives so that. The, it, you can take off the table the concern that, well, am I going to offend them? Because what if they're not actually in a crisis and I've just made this big deal? You know, this isn't about that. This is about being a caring friend, colleague, whatever your relationship is, and saying, hey, I noticed this. Are you okay? I, I'm, this is purely to support you um, and, and in, in an, out of an interest to understand what you might be experiencing right now. And when you invite that kind of open dialogue in a caring, supportive way, you will be surprised at how people will open up because we all, at the end of the day, kind of crave those deeper connections in our, in our lives. So that, that's the starting point of what everyone can do. It's taking mm-hmm. stigma out of mental health because mental health like physical health is part of human health. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's having those kind of conversations around the dinner table and in your friend groups. And um, it, it's an amazing thing. If you have 
the gift of that experience where that starts to enter your world because then there's just this freedom that comes with like being able to go there and be that authentic um, in your life and, and allow others uh, to, you know, to do the same. And Dr. Moutier, you bring up an important point in uh, starting with the idea of deepening the conversations, which is improving our connections. And again, just that idea of deepening the conversations. And when you talk about actually listening to that, that gut instinct in terms of you want to reach out, it definitely echoes, um, if you will, certain themes that Dr. Gallinger has brought up in terms of suicide-specific crisis syndrome. So, and he's a very popular, um, if you will, um, interview for our site cast. So, I mean, I recognize that. And so that, but the, but a very practical point, and I like that you and Dr. Gallinger kind of come to the same thing. It's like, have deep, meaningful conversations. And yes, that goes for us as clinicians too. And I would actually argue that you don't necessarily always need 20 to 30 minutes to do it. A lot of times it's just a connection. It's just like, if you will, right. that feeling or really being able to be present with the person. Now, mm-hmm. with that being said, there's there's the advocacy, there's the feeling. Can you just, because we never can really go through it enough, can you just give us some of the more, if you will, standard things that clinicians should be doing at visits in terms of just, just real, because because practical and bread and butter works, gosh darn it. And if we are doing more of this, we will prevent suicide case. So you give us a few of those standard things that clinicians need to just always have in their toolkit at the, at the tip of their fingers. Absolutely. And I, and I want to just make sure that clinicians know that if you trained more than, oh, even like seven or eight years ago, some of these things have, have very recently been established as part of that yeah. sort of standard practice Absolutely. for suicide risk assessment and, and preventive care when it comes to suicide. So don't, don't feel like, did I, you know, did, did the world just change or did I miss something yeah. in my training? Um, and, and it is exciting actually that, that these, what I'm going to outline are really being viewed as kind of the minimum basics mm-hmm. that health systems are starting to be held to task mm-hmm. for actually by bodies like the Joint Commission Absolutely. and um, you know other other agencies. So, um, so what we need to be doing in a mental health or behavioral health setting, there there should be routine screening for suicidal ideation, and and of course like routine screening for deterioration in in any aspect of their mental health that has been identified. But when it comes to the suicide specific standards. Suicidal ideation is kind of the key piece to screen mm-hmm. for. Now, it, in the suicide prevention expert world and research world, that would really be viewed as like the basic, basic minimum because we all know suicidal ideation is not a very sensitive or specific, mm-hmm. um, you know, predictor of mm-hmm. suicide risk. There, but but it's something. It's something to go by that would show that the person's clinical status has changed. Um, so, so there's, there's some screening um, pieces to this that we should all be doing um, because, because without it, the problem is that even though you, your patients may love you um, and have worked with you for a long time, they still will not necessarily bring it up spontaneously if they have taken a turn and they're now starting to really um, spiral in terms of their suicide risk. It's just a strange thing, but, you know, a layer of shame comes on. It's mm-hmm. part of the human instinct, and even mm-hmm. with one's doctor. And some of them also are afraid that if they if they out themselves and disclose that, of what might come to bear then at that point, you know, if they've had a bad experience with involuntary hospitalization yes. or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, so step two is once suicide risk is identified, whether it's through a suicidal ideation mm-hmm. screener or, or some other, um, you know, realizing that they just sustained loss, their depression has gotten worse, you know, they're in a financial crisis. At that point, you really need to be thinking, is mm-hmm. their suicide risk increasing? Mm-hmm. Um, once you've identified that their suicide risk has changed and has it has worsened, then at that point, it's reasonable to do as, as full a suicide risk assessment as you can do, which includes looking at some of those other factors, like I just mentioned, mm-hmm. changes in their psychosocial Mm-hmm. Um, they're, and they're also their, their clinical status. Um, and of course, if they have suicidal thoughts, you, you need to get into intent plans, whether they've started collecting the means, um, that sort of thing. Now, many, many, in fact, the majority of people who are having suicidal thoughts do not need to be hospitalized 
These are symptoms mm -hmm. of ongoing circumstances mm -hmm. and chronic conditions that in fact, if we overreact, we can um, mm. do more harm in the sense of not only resource allocation, but the patient lived experience voice is telling mm. us that there has been almost a, a feeling of not being heard and a punitive approach. And of course, as clinicians, we're always erring the side, on the side of safety. But what we're doing in the suicide prevention field is trying to build those resources that allow for a host of options in between, mm -hmm. like discharge with nothing changed, um, you know, from, from the ER mm -hmm. or from, from your outpatient clinic, um, between sort of black and white all the way to, you know, hospitalization. There should be in between things that we can do. Um, and so some of those things that you can do right there in the office are to um, either engage them in safety planning for the first time or continue and go back to their, their safety plan. Safety planning is like um, the new basic, basic way mm -hmm. that's patient centered to help a patient have a plan when they themselves um, start to spiral um, and, and their suicide risk worsens. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful tool because it is so patient centric. And, and by the way, contracting for safety is no longer considered to have any evidence. Um, and it's, you know, was a way to relieve our own anxiety and, and does not actually help patients. My name is Dr. Sanjay Gupta. I practice in Buffalo, New York. My practice involves being the chief medical officer at Brylin Hospital in Buffalo, New York. And also I'm the faculty at two medical schools the State University of New York in Syracuse, and the Jacobs School of Medicine in Buffalo. I am on the faculty of both medical schools as a clinical professor. As part of my clinical duties, I attend at eight to 10 nursing homes at any time. So seeing patients with behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia is a good part of my practice. So today's talk is going to be based on dealing with these patients, in other words, assessing them, treating them, talking to families. As you all know, the baby boomers are aging. And my friend, Dr. Tumpy, says there are three kinds of tsunamis coming. One, the baby boomers aging, as I just said. Two, older adults with substance use disorder. And three, older adults with serious and persistent mental illness. So these are the three tsunamis we're going to face in the long-term care setting, or if you're seeing older adults in your practice in any shape or form. Now, there are a lot of meta-analyses have been conducted with the use of psychotropic medications for older adults with behavioral and, psycho and psychological symptoms of dementia. So they're most of the meta-analyses are with antipsychotics, followed by a few with antidepressants and a couple with mood stabilizers. Now let's first define the neuropsychiatric symptoms as they occur in patients with dementia. There's agitation, which can occur in 80%, aggression, delusions, insomnia, anxiety, and depression. About one third of community dwelling elders, those who live in the community, may have these neuropsychiatric symptoms. And 60 to 80% of the skilled nursing facility population may have these symptoms. And these symptoms do fluctuate over time. So when we look at assessing these symptoms, the most important thing is to get a detailed history. When you and I go into a clinical facility or when you and I talk to an older adult in our practice, they reveal very little. And hence, it's very important to get collateral information from either the spouse, the relative, or staff members in the facility, if they are in a nursing facility. The staff members provide excellent collateral information, but we need to train the staff members to the kind of information they need. Otherwise we get non-specific information like confused, which doesn't really go anywhere, but we need to know the person has disorganized thought, 
they are hallucinating, they are seeing spiders, those kinds of things, it's important for the staff member to give us the right information. Often in our office practice, when we see these patients, we may need to meet with the spouse separately as in front of the index patient, the spouse may not feel comfortable talking about the paranoid ideation or the aggressive behavior that their husband or wife or their uh, significant other does at night. So I think a private meeting is always helpful in, in these cases. And that calls for a thorough assessment. Uh, collateral information from additional sources is very important. Now, the most common medicines that are used to treat these symptoms when they're diagnosed are the antipsychotic drugs. Now, rem remember, all these treatments are considered off-label based on the FDA's approach. So antipsychotic drugs overall have modest efficacy data. So the selection of the patient has to be accurate. So based on my review, risperidone has the most studies in this area, followed by olanzapine and aripiprazole. Quetiapine has limited data. Now, when we use antipsychotic drugs, there are a couple of things that we really need to worry about. One is the cardiovascular adverse events, which are thought to be higher with risperidone. And also there is the boxed warning from the FDA with regard to the antipsychotic drugs of increased mortality. It's 1.6 to 1.7 times placebo based on the placebo controlled trials. I think this data came out in somewhere around 2005. Now, antipsychotic drugs work well when there's aggression or paranoia, delusions of persecution. People may be imagining that their uh, the staff are stealing their money, staff are stealing their toothbrush, things like that. That's when they work well. They just don't work very well when somebody says, non-specifically they're agitated. A person may be agitated because they may be in pain. They may be agitated because they may have a full bladder. They could be agitated due to sensory deprivation. And in the current pandemic, we have seen a lot of this that the elders have been deprived of their loved ones meeting them. That has resulted in not only depression, it has also resulted in agitation. And I think that sensory stimulation is so important. I just was having a meeting with, with a lady, it was a telephone meeting, and her mother was in one nursing home where she was not getting enough activities. And the mother was depressed, expressing suicidal thoughts. We did not use antidepressants, we just placed her on a watch. She was transferred to another nursing home within the same group, where there's a lot of sensory stimulation. And the the lady, the older adult is a changed person. And I thought now, I didn't think that I needed to prescribe any antidepressant medicines to her. And so the environment, the stimulation is so important, which in this time of the pandemic is really been a tough time with the outbreak of COVID and restrictions of loved ones being able to go into the nursing home. I tell them you have the final say, and you could call any time and tell the staff that we need to stop this medicine. So I think having a telephonic discussion is really helpful in getting this informed consent process going, which I think is very important. Now, most of the studies, as I said, have been done with antipsychotics. There are some studies with SSRIs. People have tried fluoxetine, sertraline. They've also tried uh, citalopram. They have mild effects in most cases, not very uh, extensive. Valproic acid or divalproics has also been tried, but overall there are no clinical benefits, but there are side effects. In some cases, melatonin may help, mostly helps improve sleep, but there was one study where it seemed to help with behavioral symptoms. Trazodone was an older generic drug which was used in the past, before the atypical antipsychotics began to be used, and it was known to help with sleep and some non-specific 
aggression and agitation. The anti-dementia drugs like donazepil and memantine help in the early stages. In the later stages, less likely to. Now the dextromethorphan and quinidine combination, which comes under the trade name of new dexter, has also been shown to help. But again, that's an off-label use. This drug has been on-label for pseudobulbar affect. There are other studies which are suggestive of use of medical cannabis and, and you know, brexpiprazole as being tried. So a lot of things, but I think one is best starting with medicines that are most tried with the most trials and then go down the line. So Dr. Yellowlees, um, I remember when um, telehealth or the idea of telepsychiatry like ages ago, like two years maybe <laughs> ago, we would talk about this and we put it out and we talk about it in terms of collaborative care models and all types of things. Um, and there's been robust work done on this for probably uh, for quite some time. And you've clearly been a part of that. And then with COVID, I have to say it was in my mind somewhat amazing that we ramped up and did this with what seems like overnight. And now I would say telehealth and uh, telepsychiatry has become a big theme, not a big theme, but uh, if you're not doing it, uh, you'd be very hard pressed in this current environment to be reaching your patients. So it has now become somewhat of uh, something that we rely on, something that's integrated in our care and our practice. So Dr. Yellow, please, can you tell me and or tell the audience in terms of your perspective and how you see the psychiatry using telehealth and what have you been seeing? Sure. Well, I mean, I think the reality of life is that telepsychiatry has come of age now um, and is really here to stay. And I think it's going to change the way that we all practice permanently. I think there's no question about that. Um, prior to COVID, uh, about one to two percent of all psychiatric consultations were taking place using telepsychiatry. Um, although uh, many of us have been predicting that would, there would be a lot more use than that. And in fact, I wrote plans about how, back in 2014 about the impact of pandemics and how, how that would actually change the use of telepsychiatry. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, these things weren't uh, well planned for, but when the pandemic came, uh, actually the federal government was really very impressive and was ready for what happened and actually relaxed all the barriers and regulations that they had in place uh, that we'd been telling them about for the last 20 years um, and, and made it much easier for psychiatrists to see their patients uh, on video. Um, so I think this has been actually, uh, you know, an essential, very positive move. Um, but has actually saved the, uh, both the many patients and kept their relationships going with their psychiatrists and has actually also saved many psychiatrist practices, quite honestly, um, and allowed them to carry on practicing uh, in a time when uh, other physicians, particularly in primary care, have actually gone bankrupt. I would I would agree with you, Dr. Yalilis. I wanted to actually uh, go back to something that you just said and even work our way up to the future, because you mentioned before that you had written a paper in, in, regarding the use of telepsychiatry or telehealth in the context of a pandemic in 2014. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about what went into you writing that paper and why you decided to write it. It said you did do that and that you were thinking about that in 2014. But what what led you to write that paper? So I've been uh, involved with the American Telemedicine Association for many years, and I was actually the president during 2017. Now, that's a big association with about 10,000 members and, you know, hundreds of companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so we've always looked at, you know, where were the likely sort of business models and, it, and, and situations that might occur where the use of uh, video and also a range of other digital technologies, particularly home monitoring, um, mm -hmm. would, would be needed. Um, and in fact, this actually goes back uh, to Katrina. Uh, I was involved in a process uh, with Katrina uh, where we looked at how we could have used uh, telepsychiatry much more effectively to, to help all of the people who were abandoned in Katrina and you know, particularly the sort of poor and, 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 uh, and black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, the, and before that, I was actually involved in the SARS outbreak in, in Hong Kong looking at the same issue. So that, that goes back 20 plus years, thinking about how we could use digital technologies following some sort of pandemic or major disaster. 
Um, so, so for some of us, this was no surprise, unfortunately. Um, mm. <laughs> and uh, there has been a lot of thought and work gone into this over, the, over many years. Um, and uh, I mean, it's just, at one level, it's, it's sort of really good that we've been prepared and been able to switch so quickly uh, in a pandemic situation. At another level, it's very sad that it's taken a pandemic to make this happen. One of the things in, that I reflect upon in terms of uh, telehealth or telepsychiatry, but similar to many practitioners, I had to adjust my practice to a hybrid model uh, involving uh, telepsychiatry. The thing that I actually was a bit, if you will, surprised by was how many of my patients readily adapted to it. It was, was it a change? Yes, but it was not as, you know, you kind of have these cognitive distortions of gloom and doom and what's going to happen and how is this going to work and the person isn't in my office and I can't hear them, I can't feel them. And you know that, I, I mean, I, I consider myself an introverted person, except when I'm talking to my patients. And I, I, I like to like be in the same space with them. However, I would say that, again, again uh, given the current situation, I've been pleasantly pleased with what, how, you, how I've been able to interact with a number of my patients, particularly those that just are in, if you will, maintenance treatment. And I, and many of them have actually told me that, you know, doc, you know, how long is this going to continue? I'm like, well, I don't know, but to be perfectly frank with you, it's going to be hard to justify having you, the time, the expenditure, the parking, the this, the that, the other, for at least a certain cohort of my patients coming back uh, into the office of uh, pandemic or no pandemic. And Dr. Yellow Lees, uh, could you talk to us a little bit about what maybe the future is going to hold for, again, maybe a bit of a hybrid model where you're, you're going to be utilizing telehealth and telepsychiatry in addition to seeing patients still what we are used to brick and mortar in person? Yeah, so I think, I think that's a really key issue. I mean, I've personally been working in a hybrid model myself for several years now. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, uh, all of the patients who you know get referred to see me specifically through the university uh, essentially have the option and have had the option for several years to see me uh, either in person or via video or both. Mm -hmm. um, so the same person at different times depending on their convenience and their need and my convenience and my need. Um, and so I've been working in a hybrid way for a number of years, and we've written a lot about this. Uh, Jay Shaw and I wrote a textbook uh, on telepsychiatry uh, that was published two years ago that actually talks about this hybrid model of care as being the long-term model of care that actually most psychiatrists will start using. Now, the reason for that is really simple. It's because patients love this, and yeah. as you've discovered yourself. And, yeah. and patient satisfaction has always been immensely high with the use of video. Um, it's actually a more egalitarian process for patients. It's less intimidating. Um, mm -hmm. They don't have to come and wait, obviously. It's more convenient. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, they're in their own place. They're in their own uh, home or in many cases, um, and you've probably had the same experience. I yes. see a lot, of, a lot of my patients in their cars nowadays. Yes. Um, because the car is actually the convenient place that is private. Um, yes. As long as they're not driving, obviously. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I see the car as being almost the new therapy room. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so uh, it, it's actually, uh, you know, in some respects, a better process for the patient. The other thing that's nice is you can find out more about your patient. Um, yeah. by seeing them on video, because you can get them to show you around their home, to show you around yeah. their garden. You can talk to them about the paintings on the wall. You can check out what they've got in the fridge. You can see how they, how organized mm -hmm. or disorganized they might be by just looking around their house. Yes. Um, um, and uh, you can do all sorts of things on video, uh, essentially the return of the home visit um, uh, that, you know, some of us used to do many years ago in which we've stopped doing that. So I think there's a lot of advantages to seeing patients on video, and the patients love it. The patients love see those advantages. We're the ones who've been slow. Now, with this hybrid model, this is uh, the two, I'm going, I'm asked two questions with this. Um, first question is, um, I'm curious how you feel as though in the future, like psychiatric practice is going to develop, like for the, be more granular. I'm like, I wonder how much office space we're going to need. Like many of us practice, we have X, Y, or Z amount of office space. Um, but what we still require, I mean, you, you're not a prophet, but I mean, what we still require the same office overhead if we were to utilize this hybrid model? 
I think it's, we clearly won't. I mean, there's no question about that. I think mean, many more of us are gonna be practicing from home. Uh, I've practiced at home exclusively for the last uh, six months now, and I'm sure many other people watching this have done the same. Uh, and we suddenly wonder why did we have that office? Um, yeah. You know, I think we need to have some process clearly for making appointments and notes and, you know, all of this sort of administrative aspects. Um, but actually, really, there isn't a great need to have an office, um, particularly for people in private practice. Um, and so I, I've, uh, I've actually asked the same question of many colleagues on different uh, calls like this. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just thinking from the last 40 or 50 people I've asked, literally, I've only had one person who said they're going to practice in exactly the same way as they used to before COVID, after yeah. COVID. So I think people are going to dramatically change their practices. And can I just jump into one, sure. one other thing that you said a minute ago, which I think is really important, Dr. Norris, this issue of intimacy. Yes. Um, the, the, the sort of fantasy in the past for most psychiatrists has been that, that uh, seeing people on video will be sort of not as good as in person, mm -hmm. okay? I actually argue with many patients it's a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is that um, the patients on the whole actually can be more intimate on video mm. than they can in person, particularly when it's about topics that are stigmatized or embarrassing. So things like, um, you know, their sexuality, ab about uh, HIV, um, maybe about women who've been raped or, you know, where there's been trauma. Um, you know, it's not surprising, but in fact, with the little bit of extra distance you get on video, it's easier to actually um, talk more and to, to, to tell more. Uh, to the, the person you're speaking to. So we know that you can have very intimate conversations on video that are actually often easier to have for the patient um, than they would be in the office setting. And I've had many patients over the years who've you know, started seeing me on video and suddenly told me all this stuff on video um, mm -hmm. about you know, traumas and other issues that they've never told me in the office. Um, and they've sort of looked a bit surprised on occasions. Um, but but the, the other thing that comes into action, apart from this, this ability, the distance, is that mm -hmm. on video, people can be a little bit disinhibited also. Yes. Um, you know, yes. you just said yourself that, you know, you're sort of more extrovert. Um, yeah. and, uh, and I think we are a little bit sometimes. And that also actually enhances the relationship that you have with your patient um, and can actually enhance also the amount of information that you're able to transmit. Telehealth in one shape or form or another is going to be here to stay. It just makes too much sense. Do you have any particular recommendations? Obviously, you've written a textbook, you and Dr. Shore. Uh, so, I mean, perhaps everyone should just read the textbook. But other than that, I mean, it's a simple thing. Go out and buy the textbook. Um, but other than that, um, do you have any thoughts in regards to recommendations in terms of telepsychiatry for those in the educational community who are teaching medical students and residents for this new paradigm? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, at UC Davis, we have mandated that our residents do telepsychiatry now for several years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we've put in place a, a relatively brief training uh, process for them. Um, and, and that literally involves, as you said, reading the textbook. And in fact, one of the chapters in the textbook um, uh, is the one that we actually focus them on. And that's a, an entire chapter on clinical skills on video. Mm -hmm. um, and so, because you don't see that in general psychiatric right. books. <laughs> um, no, you don't. But in fact, you actually need to learn some simple media skills and how to actually present yourself and how to interact nicely with people. Um, so, um, so I think that's, so there is some essential reading, I think, that you need to do. Um, and then really the rest of it, we've just uh, in the past had, had uh, residents sitting in with me or with one of the other attendings when we're actually seeing patients. So we, we watch them do a patient or so first on, on telepsychiatry. But quite honestly, the residents are usually ahead of us. I mean, yeah. they, they use uh, video all the time uh, in their own personal lives. Um, it's no big drama for them. Uh, no. and, and quite honestly, most residents look at uh, people from my generation in particular and just think, you know, hey, why aren't we doing this much more? Um, because it's their norm. Um, so really the training for our residents nowadays, for people from the sort of Gen Z and millennial uh, <laughs> generations, um, is really actually no big deal. Um, the, the issue is, uh, is looking at what are the workflow processes. Yes. Um, and so, for instance, I supervise intakes all the time. So do other attendings in, at, at UCD. 
Um, and we just have uh, the patient is in their home, the resident is in their home, and we're in our home. Um, mm -hmm. And we have a process where the resident and the patient meet first. Uh, the resident then uh, emails or texts uh, the, the attending when they're ready. We uh, beam into uh, one of two different video systems and have a chat mm -hmm. with the resident by themselves. And then we go and meet the patient in whichever video system they're in and have a threesome um, and, and finish off the intake just in the same way as we might do in, in a normal training intake. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we're in three different homes using one or two different video systems and we just have a process that, that uh, we all understand and it works beautifully.